Hello boys and girls, I'm coming at you with another paper review in the machine learning domain, the platonic representation hypothesis. This has been making the rounds, I think, because Ilya uh, X OpenAI has liked it. Um, and so I saw some people on Twitter talk about it and I thought I'd give it a go. It has this alluring philosophical name that turns me on. Um, although, uh, I mean, in the end, these scientists seem to be uh, just uh, physicalists. <laughs> so the, the platonic, we, we will see what, what the platonic means here in this, in this paper. Um, there is a bunch of math in the paper and then some uh, speculation and I find these pa papers valuable in that you know it gives us some new voc vocabulary and then we can discuss to what extent uh, this might be true, where it fails, so this is valuable. I think the authors are also at uh, ICML in uh, July where I will also be. So. What is this about? Um, you can see it here on the first page. The uh, platonic representation hypothesis in a nutshell is here um, written down as neural networks trained with different objectives on different data and modalities are converging to a shared statistical model of reality in their representation spaces. So there's a bunch of uh, concepts to unpack here and um, the paper is uh, on the nose 26 pages but really only 10 pages and then 10 pages of appendix the um, main concept i think are sort of um, uh, made clearer maybe from um, two of the graphics so here is one sketch where you have some physical objects um, and they are projected into some let's say camera and you have some pixels here of these objects you know this this pyramid on this this, uh, this sphere and then uh, this is as image data as modality of uh, visual modality fed into some um, training process for a neural network F um, here. We will discuss the mathematics of this a little bit later. And the same data here, maybe uh, the visuals are uh, also translated to some other kind of data. Maybe people talk about whatever they see here in uh, physical space and then this is a uh, text which uh, is obviously correlated with what is seen here so a red uh, sphere next to a blue cone as a sentence and that makes it to some other model and the idea is that uh, despite the fact that you have different modalities and not just different modalities but also um, different neural networks with uh, different efforts there the hypothesis here is that there is something uh, um, converging such that the, um, the internals of uh, different machine learning uh, trained routines represent something which is similar or highly correlated. And this is then uh, discussed in the paper um, in some detail and some versions of it. And um, so things boil down to one thing and that is basically the platonic abstraction that the single abstraction from that so i have to note that this is not you know it's not actually platonism and platonist ideals in the sense that you have these forms which are prior to physical space but actually the platonic thing here is what ends up in the model and they um, uh, talk of this you know this thing that you can have a photo of is uh, reality so the physical is for them the reality so for anybody who is interested in philosophy this will uh, not be not very satisfying they just use the, the terminology of uh, platonism in the same sense that you know some esoteric circles use the word quantum they just take some some you know um, uh, concepts which are associated with platonism and translate it to their own language so uh, i just want to say this because uh, what I found interesting is a little bit of the title, and but the title uh, is really backstabbed. But nonetheless, the paper is uh, nonetheless interesting. So we will continue with this. Um, so um, we uh, have a second image, which basically um, is a little bit more concrete and which explains this, um, which I browse to. So there's this page, uh, uh, I think this is page six and this image 
where they give uh, concrete examples and then they also uh, did some experiments, taking some Wikipedia ta data and, and uh, um, uh, producing evidence for their thesis. So what you have here is um, uh, pixel colors or colors in general, and you have you know the words associated with that. And you can, you can imagine that you have some data sets where the colors are being talked about and in, the, in, in this uh, sentences, right, the coherent English language sentences, let's say, um, colors are associated with each other, um, appear together, you know, I don't know, if you have uh, like canonical uh, red objects, blood, and um, uh, then there's some context, skin or whatever. And um, then uh, the, the idea is that uh, you, you train uh, two different neural networks, one takes images, the other takes text, and then the the internal representations the the features as they sit in in feature space that are uh, produced you know this is some some numerical data in a, some higher dimensional space um, in a, a certain sense that we will discuss um, um, is the same even if you take uh, models trained on these different modalities and. Of course, you can argue that there's a physical space out there from which all this data um, initially is produced. And then here the claim is then uh, for different um, models, and especially as they get uh, better at whatever tasks they're um, tuned to do, um, you also have on the other side in these trained spaces that these models, then these, these uh, internal aspects of them also converge to something, right? So, so. Um, as opposed to uh, all the different models doing something different. And uh, I saw uh, on the internet, there were some comments who uh, were like, well, you know, da, this is uh, sort of, um, is, is this not clear? And I think there is an intuition that this, is, that this can happen. And some may, might even think that this should happen um, from a training perspective and from, you know, from the, um, perspective of uh, wanting to generate good models. I think this is sort of a white pill. This is something good because um, that means there there might be uh, there's some co coherence to the whole to the whole thing of developing um, uh, strong AI, right? Um, and uh, there are some parts like some readings of this uh, hypothesis, which you think, well, this is sort of clear. And then there's others where you can come up with sort of uh, uh, counter uh, ideas, uh, counter examples, and we're going to go through the paper. But uh, here, um, in the last uh, section of the paper, before the abstract, at least, uh, they um, also discuss counter arguments. And I will not, you know, go over all points. But um, here, this one, I sort of highlighted. You see sometimes my highlighting box, uh, and I will read it out because this is. A sort of nice uh, example for a counterexample and and these questions we, we might want to ask. Um, so one immediate objection to our, our hypothesis is: what about the information that is unique to a given modality? Can language really describe the ineffable experience of watching a total solar eclipse? Or how could an image convey a concept like "I believe in freedom of speech," uh, which is easy to write in English? Two different models cannot converge to the same representation if they have access to the fundamentally different information. Um, and so these are some, I think, good uh, extreme examples where you can really ask, you know, can this concept like freedom, how is this, uh, like, is this, does this even, like I ask, is this even like emerging as some, some, uh, some feature in a space? Um, can, um, is there even parity between uh, uh, notions? You know, if you, you, the typical example in philosophy is you have this abstract notion of a tree. Um, you can see that the tree or the bird will pop up in some latent space, and also there's image representations um, of a tree. And so, uh, from from visuals, you might think an, an, a tree can emerge. Uh, although I think this is also not completely obvious that that uh, all these models uh, can abstract all the the, the, the we think correct um, abstractions, but uh, in particular if you go then go through something like freedom, right, freedom of speech, um, uh, to what extent does it make sense that you will find a similarity of these um, uh, models if there seem to be features which are particular to different modalities and so on and so forth, and. Um, 
even if you grant that there are things which definitely appear in both uh, modalities, I, like I will give the examples of text and um, and uh, images, but you can could also imagine there are some other modalities on which you can train the model. I don't know. Um, like if you um, talk about a theater plays, right? And if you have photos of a theater play, like a, a, a script or a textbook, right? Then it's not uh, like a priori clear that if you have a lot of photos of a theater plays or books, that uh, like a books of fairy tale books, for example, that that uh, in feature space you would find a similarity um, arising from photos of books and um, uh, the analog where people talk about books in, in, in texts, right? So that the, the, the is, in, in a fairy tale text, people will talk a little bit more about the content, which is sort of hidden in a picture of just a book, right? So uh, Brothers Grimm book uh, might, like images of that might not be associated necessarily with um, their contents. But then again, if you um, are on the internet and you scrape data and there might be fictional depictions of the fairy tales and then that, that might be indeed the case. So this is sort of the the, 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 uh, the point here that these uh, different modalities are converging in, in the same representation and we will discuss in some detail what that means or what it can mean. Um, but then also uh, not just, you know, I, I'm, I'm, um, I'm focusing now on the modalities, but there's also the thing with um, different tasks or different uh, mo models. And they um, are here very positive in the sense that they say, well, um, they have the feeling that this um, indeed uh, everything converges to uh, this shared so-called platonic representations, this one representation. So this is what this text is about. Um, and they uh, then, uh, in part, the paper is like a sort of half survey paper. They have a lot of references throughout, not just in the standard, in, after in the introduction sections, but they had like reference a million of other things. And the, the, um, the reference section is also particularly long in this paper. Um, and the, the other part, however, then is, 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 is sort of mathy. And I have some questions uh, to what extent the math models that they cook up as sort of uh, trying to explain their concept is applicable to all uh, the machine learning models that one can conceive, but I will, you know, uh, let you know what what, uh, what questions I have to the paper. Um, okay, so uh, here are some, uh, some so standard definitions. The main object uh, of interest that we want to keep in mind is this sort of um, function f from the data to uh, some feature space, uh, giving us um, a feature vector. And uh, we talk about the outputs of these uh, different Fs, right? And then the question arises, so how do you even compare um, the uh, different networks? And uh, one of the key metrics, and in the appendix, they discuss a lot of different approaches to how you could measure, measure that, is this uh, mutual nearest neighbor uh, metric um and i have uh the one thing that i have prepared for this video is some um cheap uh, paint pictures and this is not directly taken from the paper but this is just for me to sort of illustrate it and explain it here in this video um first i want to talk about something different so um the uh, the, the the box that you see here you can think of as r2 so uh, some euclidean space and then we have a bunch of uh, these dots which in the end are the outputs of these f functions. The, these are the the, uh, the features representing whatever um, uh, con uh, like data conglomerate, conglomerate um, is translated by the learned model. Um, so, for example, you know you have a bunch of uh, trees, and then you get a tree as as a sort of feature object in in, in feature space is one variant. And so you have a bunch of these feature uh, points in the space. Um, and um, I label them with just some letters. And then um, the point I want to make is that if you have any sort of foilation where um, you um, draw uh, lines of equality here, right? So here I draw like five lines or whatever. Um, 
and these are ordered, right? You have you you f have a foliation of the whole space, and this is ordered. In this case, I have like some finite index set, but it can even be a continuum. Then um, these uh, few uh, points are then also uh, ordered or clustered, right? So if I go from here, this is the, the this first line. Uh, the the k is is before this, and then accord, like with respect to this foliation, j comes next, and then i and and, and g comes next. If this um, foliation uh, like does not distinguish here in this whole in this whole uh, band, and so here in the second picture I have the same points. Right, I just copy pasted this. The, the the a is here, the c is here. So the points are the same, but my foliation is a little bit different. And so the resulting um, ordering of these uh, these points is then different, right? So K is here, but then uh, comes B and and G. They're actually in the same um, band, and so on and so forth. And so what you can do is, and this goes more towards what they do in the paper is, so you have a, again these points, and then you define some sort of metric and it does not even have to fulfill all the mathematical metric axioms it just has to has to uh, like assign uh, some numbers for uh, pairs of points um, and uh, you take all the points in in uh, in space and then you um, you you have lines so these are the lines uh, around g and then in this way you uh, have some notion of neighbor right so for example the the k and j and f are close to g and um, this is, is then the order that emerges in this way and the point is this that if even if uh, you have some point here in the last picture that my points are completely differently distributed um, but i have uh, like labeled them in such a way that if you do and then again some this, this sort of clustering um, then it just so happens that even if the, these, these uh, data points, these, these letters are represented completely different, like with the eye in the space, their sort of association, their nearest neighbor is still here the, um, very similar, right, between these things. And in this, in this sense, right, with respect to the, the, the neighbors of G in this case, the um, these pictures are similar right the neighborhoods of g are sim similar and here in this picture i have not cared about like uh, like tuning those things in any way you would also do this for d for example here in the below picture we see e and f are sort of close to d and in this case this is also true for this picture but then um you know i have just randomly just paint uh, draw this this picture for other uh for other points, this might be violated. But you can see here that even, like you don't really need much. You, you basically need this point embedded in some space and then this sort of distance. And then you can apply this uh, like computation of uh, neighborhood. And then there's a lot of ways in which you can do that. And in this way, express a similarity, right? I hope uh, I sort of made this clear. Okay. Um, and, um, before we go to more of the math and talk a little bit about the kernels and a little bit about, about the simpler models that they discuss uh, to make their point, we uh, I will browse for some of the arguments. So um, they um, okay. So I'm I'm just going to read out this this uh, these points which which are next to the survey. So you know they, they sort of um, promise or erase the hope that. Um, that this sort of alignment will happen, especially with stronger and and uh, and bigger models. And um, um, apparently, there there seem to be uh, previous papers in the recent years which go a lot in the same direction. If you read this text and look at the dates of the references, they uh, they, they pick up a lot of. Um, uh, previous papers, recent papers, and um, then in the next few sections, they will recite a bunch of different uh, related hypotheses uh, which go in the same direction and which they say support their their hope. Um, so you have, um, let me press down. So uh, one argument they make for uh, these conversions happening is that um, this uh, the multitask scaling hypothesis. I read uh, there are fewer representations that are competent for n tasks than there are for uh, a smaller uh, number of tasks m. Um, 
as we train more general models that solve more tasks um, at once, we should expect fewer possible solutions. So they ha have a picture for this here. So it is thing in green here. Um, they say, you know, you have some task, um, this violet task and this uh, turkey's uh, task. And um, if you train uh, your machine learning routine to solve certain um, uh, problems, there might be different approaches that actually work with solving the problem. So you have a bunch of possible solutions which actually fulfill the task. But if you then on top of that also want that the same model that you train uh, solve some other task, maybe you have some completely novel um, data, maybe you know it's about uh, animal classification and you find another um, animal that you can add to a database, then um, some of the um, the routines that would have solved uh, all uh, previous solutions um, are now not actually solving a new one. So you have basically to move down from the violet thing if you want to, if you, you have the the, the, uh, the the violet space of solving task one, but if you now also want to solve task two, then you have to narrow this down. And so there is some sort of shrinking of uh, legal solutions. And so to the extent that we only take um, models into account that actually solve all tasks well, to the extent that we, you know, as we progress, getting better machine learning models, um, to the extent that this actually works of getting better, then also the sort of the, the space shrinks and thereby there's some shrinking going on and thereby um, even if you start with different um, uh, models and we tune them and then apparently also different modalities then we're just moving into the, the sort of same uh, abstract space and this is one sort of argument for the for a convergence and then also here um, a, a different uh, but like so, sort of <laughs> similar Venn diagram sort of argument the capacity hypothesis, bigger models are more likely to converge to a shared representation than smaller models. So um, here's another picture. This is a little bit different. You have um, different uh, sort of, um, I would say like uh, optimality towards solving a task. So let's say um, there's, there's this problem and um, I think the, um, the middle point here represents sort of the bottom, the optimal um, solution as far as, you know, uh, training against the cost is concerned. And if you have a, a smaller model, then you basically, you can cover all this area and the, the you know, ex most extreme one is here on this bound and this other um, routine, uh, ML routine um, also tries to get down to this point. Uh, if you grow um, the, the capacities, you know, I don't know, more weights, I think, then um, these blobs that represent all the options that you can cover uh, grow and eventually they will overlap. And in this, in this way, um, if both are able to reach uh, the optimum, then uh, they necessarily are overlapping. And there's another notion in which in this abstract um, convergence is achieved there, right? Okay. Um, yeah, and then here, uh, here's a point. Um, arriving at the same mapping on the training data does not prohibit the models from developing distinct internal representations. And so I think, I hope this I made sort of clear with this uh, with these pictures, right? So even if this representation here is in fact uh, different, you know, they're not saying that the, the, the um, Euclidean space representation, it ends up the same. But the thing that we care about um, in this case, uh, you know, closeness of like association of concepts is the same, you know, with this sort of a neighborhood metric. And we will talk a little bit more about this. Um, okay, and then uh, they also have this uh, uh, simplicity bias hypothesis. I don't, didn't really grok um, why that uh, would com come about, but here I'll read it out to you. Uh, the deep networks are biased towards finding simple fits to the data and the bigger model, the stronger the bias. Therefore, as models get bigger, we should expect convergence to a smaller solution space. So there's some things uh, where they talk about regular regularization and I can see how that affects the sort of outputs, uh, like the, the way that the model functions. But then they refer to some other papers and I have not looked at the reference for this review and I didn't really get that. Um, but uh, there you go, okay. So um, what they 
you know, one question that arises and I have not really uh, fully understood it. And as always, please comment uh, in the in the boxes below and engage in some discussions there. Um, the um, I, I, for, for, for one, I'm not 100% sure um, to what extent different architectures, you know, there is a broad range of architectures for ML routines. To what extent they are really all nicely represented by the sort of feature vector idea, right? And th there are some cases where you have the deep learning bottleneck and you actually uh, pass through some representations and fe feature representation, but I don't think that's, you can say that's universal enough. And um, I'm not sure to what extent uh, they um, want to extend this <laughs> platonic representation idea to the, the whole scope of machine learning models. I don't know really know where they draw the line, but I have to admit I also didn't read that uh, three times the paper. Um, maybe they are uh, more uh, like direct and cut out a lot of models. I don't know. Um, uh, then what they also do is they, um, in, in this one section four, uh, they um, uh, are then a little bit more uh, uh, concrete in the sense that they give an example hypothesis um, what uh, what actually the thing is that they converge to, right? So I was like um, hand waving a little bit with my drawings here. Um, but then uh, they uh, give a ma mathematical model um, where they speak about the uh, what they call real world, you know, the, the original source for all their um, the different modalities, let's say. Um, and then they sort of construct a scenario where, where you have like a distribution from which this the data items are sampled and then some projections from which you make the observation that eventually fit the model. Um, and they impose some mathematical, like for the sake of this explanation, uh, impose some mathematical constrictions on this. They have this sort of projections, but they want them to be bijective for the sake of what we will see in a second. Um, and then they uh, talk about uh, uh, contrastive learners in particular. So then it's about um, um, explicitly um, uh, learning when things pop, uh, like appear together uh, or not, right? So they basically cook up the scenario where um, a lot of these things are like explicitly desired. Uh, and then they do um, you know, some, some uh, some uh, light one page math and uh, propose that if you have this underlying model of um, uh, out, like source space, physical space or reality, then uh, the point wise mutual information information kernel is sort of the, the um, an example for this model, uh, which gives you uh, the correct sort of metric and um, the um, the thing that these ML models would be converging to, which is ex exemplified in this sort of um, modeling of, uh, of this whole scenario, is this uh, probability of source space. I call it source space, they call it reality. Um, um, and then, you know, this uh, uh, bijectivity assumption for this pro observation projections they um, put there that they can say, at least in this mathematical model, they can then actually say from from the uh, distribution that they model for the observations uh, uh, that those really then refer to um, the a source, right? If you if these projections are projections, uh, then you know then, uh, then it's not really like projection as you intuit usually usually you think about losing information if you don't lose information then you can say oh you know i'm collecting more and more data and then i can infer back from the excess the um the that are the data that i learned from to the sets to the underlying reality and in this case then you you learn actually something about reality itself and this is sort of this platonic representation reflected in the model okay sorry my explanation here is very hand wavy you will have to read the paper so this is the sort of um uh, uh, ugly um, summary that I can give here. Okay, and then as you see, there's a bunch of uh, references. And in the end, I would just want to emphasize, there is then some more math. Um, they uh, study uh, differences and talk about differences, difference between kernels and, and uh, sort of distance metrics. And they talk about their nearest neighbor, mutual nearest neighbor, 
um, definitions and there's some a little bit of a like formal math section and um, about their Wikipedia experiments and here again more about this uh, sorry sorry for browsing so quickly but this newer, nearest neighbor um, options and clearly they have started this uh, in some detail there and do some uh, classifications and um, I'm not going to into too much detail about the experiments but then they also uh, here's this color experiment um, and then there is I think some uh, proofs about their mutual information and uh, simplified mathematical model thing. Um, okay, so uh, as always, I always try to be quick, but I'm not really quick. Half an hour, well, that's, that's fine. Um, okay, so uh, please let me know in the in the comments what you think about that, uh, especially if you read the p paper yourself and um, have a little bit more insight about the things where I raise questions here in this video, in particular, to what extent you actually think that all these ideas translate to the broad scope of machine learning stuff that is out there. Um, if you think, like where you think that uh, this hypothesis surely works and where it will um, stop not working, it will help if you actually read this last section where I have brought up one uh, point um, <laughs> of a critique that they um, came up with themselves but there are some other uh, arguments uh, sort of against it and I, I nonetheless like it because this sort of idea gives uh, a language to, to uh, talk about what we should try and um, how we could they started researching about how we can uh, compare the alignments and, and do some work in this direction and i would like to see if more uh, papers actually try to do this um, this comparison uh, of feature space. Okay, um, that's it for today. I wish you a nice weekend.